As uh, some of the people probably here know, I was lucky enough to be on sabbatical last year, hosted by Muriel, um, doing information theory style stuff, which you'll hear about probably at some stage. But also Muriel, a couple of years ago, introduced me to uh, Catherine Gergacek, who works in, runs the, the DNA forensics program in BU. And I spent a lot of last year working on that, including not only myself, but also Desmond Lunn, who is Muriel's ex-student, is the chair of computer science in Rutgers in Camden at the moment. Um, and if when we next have this meeting, I'm forewarning you, I'm going to talk about DNA forensics, because I think we're going to do something very cool in it. Um, but whatever positive karma I got from doing that work last year, I probably expanded by working with a different colleague, uh, Christina Lokelso, who works on blood system development, because we ended up giving pentobarbital to an awful lot of mice, which resulted in their death. <laughs> and now, to be fair, at least a large proportion of these mice were suffering from a horrendous acute myeloid leukemia that was going to kill them anyway. But I don't really get off the hook because we gave it to them. Yeah. <laughs> right, so anyway, but, uh, if Eric was around, I, would, I think he would be interested in this work. So, uh, you know, Shrikant pointed out that he's much younger than Sean. And I just want to point out, I'm much younger than Shrikant. So uh, I grew up on a heady mix of uh, papers from Peter, actually. Peter's early papers in the n early 1990s were very influential to me uh, during my PhD, and on Sean's, and then on Shrikant's when I started working in networking. And then basically I abandoned you all yeah. uh, sometime, <laughs> sometime after about 2007 when I met Phil Hodgkin, who was hugely influential in my life. Uh, and basically Phil is a remarkable scientist who's very unusual for a biologist. He, he basically has had a work program that he's been pursuing uh, since the early 1990s. And I rode in with him about 10 years ago. Um, and I wanted to tell you part of that story today. But in order to do that, um, I have to give you some background. And some of that background means I have to tell you a little bit about how your immune system works. Uh, and then I have to tell you a little bit about cancer immunotherapy, which is basically, if you go to any drug development stuff, you go to anything about cancer, uh, all you hear about at the moment is cancer immunotherapy. It's a big thing, and I want to tell you a little bit about it, because it's going to motivate what we're going to do. So I'm going to give you sketches of those two things. And somehow, in something that seems probably very tenuous and unlikely, I'm going to claim that in worrying about these things, I need to fret about the following problem. Okay? And so if you get bored with the biology, you can always sit and puzzle with this problem. Okay? So what we're going to be interested in much later in the talk is we're going to be interested in uh, algebras where we're stimulating cells to divide. Um, and we're going to be interested in how cells in interpret multiple signals. Okay? So here's the little mathematical puzzle. The little mathematical puzzle is uh, imagine I have an object and I stimulate it with x and it divides once. Okay? Uh, if I took that object and I stimulated it with y, it would divide twice. So the, the red is always going to indicate kind of terminal leaves and the blue will I indicate still dividing. And kind of what I'm interested in is if I was to ask you, okay, uh, I'm going to give this cell x and then I'm going to give it y, sort of what would I expect it to do if it was kind of, you know, linearly interpolating those signals, interpreting those signals. And what you would do is you would go, okay, I'm going to take this root node and I'm going to glue it on here and I'm going to glue it on here and I get a tree that looked like that, okay? I just append it onto the end. And if I gave you y first followed by x, I would still get the same resulting concatenated tree, right? If I took y, I gave it y, made it expand twice, and then I, I hit it with whatever the signal x was, I would pin this onto all of those red leaves, and I would get the same tree over on the right, okay? But the problem is, if the trees are not regular, this is not a commutative operation, okay? So if I was to instead give you these two trees, which are not perfectly regular depth, then depending on whether I gave x first followed by y, which will be this one on the top, right? So what I would do is I'd take this, append this to each of those red nodes, and I get that thing on the top. But on the bottom, what I did is I give it y first, and then I would append x onto the end, and I would get this other tree, right? And the thing is, they're not isomorphic. And so therefore, the operation of the order in which I give these things is not commutative, okay? But if you notice, the number of, so if, if, I, if I record the number of terminal leaves 
and what I'm going to call each generation. So this is a generation zero object, generation one, generation two, generation three. What you'll see is that there are no terminal leaves in generation zero, none in, term in generation one, but in both threes there are two in generation uh, two and there are four in generation three. Right? And the question, so if you lose track of everything else I say or you get bored with me, the question I have for you is am I a cheeky bastard and have just picked an example where this works or is it a general property? And if it's a general property, how general is it? And my claim, as I said, is somehow fretting about cancer immunotherapy is going to have led me to this question. And if somebody else knows where this arises elsewhere, I'd be, I'd be interested to know because we looked and we just couldn't find it. Okay. And I said I was going to give you a sketch of your immune system, and, and I wasn't lying. Uh, I drew this on my board a couple of days ago in my office. Uh, and so everybody in this room, we all have uh, two types of immune system. Sorry. Uh, there's something called the innate immune system, which is very old, and plants and everything has. And it responds in a non-specific way to patterns. Jawed vertebrates, uh, of which everybody in this room is, um, on the other hand, have a secondary system, which is remarkable, called the adaptive um, immune system. And it's based on the following principle. Everybody in this room has order, it's actually 2 by 10 to the 12, of these small cells called lymphocytes. Uh, I'm mainly going to talk about T cells. It doesn't really matter, but you have 10 to the 12 of them. It's a phenomenally large number. Right? I, I want to pause and really make you think about it. This is a phenomenal number of these objects. And if you took a book from the 1950s, uh, a medical book, and you looked in it and you said, well, what's a lymphocyte? It would say a lymphocyte is a small cell whose function is not known. And uh, lymphocytes are the core to your immune system. What happens with a lymphocyte, um, and I'm only going to talk about T cells, but um, if I take a lymphocyte, I will see on its cell surface a receptor. And the receptor is literally just a physical protein that sticks out with a specific shape. I give you one lymphocyte, one T cell, it will have thousands and thousands of copies of this one receptor. And with that receptor, it sees the outside world. And how does it see that outside world? It's through a complementarity of shapes. It has this receptor, it has, it's like a lock and key thing, it has a shape on its surface. And should it come across something that has the complementary shape, it triggers a signal into the cell. Okay? The remarkable thing is if I take two cells from, from Peter and I look at them, each one of them will have thousands and thousands of these receptors, but they will be distinct on the two cells. Okay? with very high likelihood. It's a big topical subject that people are doing a lot of work on at present. So how does this work? How it works is a pathogen gets into your body. And somehow one of these cells that has a complementary receptor, so this pathogen comes in, it's, it has proteins on its cell surface. If it's a bacteria, if it's a virus, it's encapsulated in things. One of these cells comes along and they bump into each other and if they form a good bind, then what happens is you have identified one cell in your body that can recognize this foreign invader out of your 10 to the 12. So just to give you a, a rough idea, it depends on the infection. But um, for something like a flu, it might be as small as you may have 100 cells in your body that recognize something in the flu as being foreign. Right, tiny, tiny numbers. You now have this small number of cells that can recognize you have a foreign invader. And so what they do is they build a clonal army. Uh, they massively expand. That one cell that can see this foreign invader uh, divides and divides and divides, making clonal copies of offspring, all of which have the same receptor that it has. That swelling you get in a lymph node when you have a cold, that's that clonal expansion. Uh, if you have a cold or a flu, well, flu is probably a better example, it could go through uh, 15 to 20 divisions. So you go from one cell and at the end of it you may have an army that looks like 2 to the 15 or 2 to the 20 of those cells. It's a massive, massive endeavor. You now have this army of cells that can recognize the foreign invader depending on whether they're a B or a T cell. They fight the foreign invader in different ways. Um, they uh, eliminate it and then they primarily die off. Like this, you've had this huge clonal army, all fit for one purpose. It dies off, and what it leaves behind are what are called memory cells. The memory cells, which are these yolks and, uh, illustrated on the right, uh, 
are very, very long lived. Um, depending on some of the fact, uh, some of the illnesses you may have had in your life, these will be with you for the rest of your life. Uh, and they are the basis of vaccination. And the reason for it is that if, if I was to give you a sketch of what the cell numbers in your body look like as a function of time, the first time you see some new infection, you can bear in mind, if, if you launch an immune response against something that turns out to not be a foreign invader, you're going to end up with autoimmune disorders and all sorts of other problems. So what happens is there's actually quite a lot of checks and balances go on. And the first time you see an infection, uh, these checks and balances take about a day or two. So your body goes through about a day or two of figuring out, have, have enough parts of your immune system seen a foreign invader for you to believe that you should launch a response. You then got this massive exponential increase in the number of cells that can fight the, fight the infection. They do so, they clear off, and that, that will take a week or two. But what happens, and it's kind of clever, because of course it's not designed, not unless you're from a certain, you know, maybe from your, if you're from Alabama, maybe you think it's designed. I don't think it's designed. If you were to design it, what would you do, right? So, so what you would do is, I saw a pathogen. I, I took a while to make my mind up and I fought that thing and I'm still alive. Next time I see that pathogen, I'm not going to wait. No point in doing the checks and balances. It was the right thing to do last time around. And so that's what happens. The second time you see this infection, these memory cells, they just get going instantaneously. And so the purpose of vaccination is to not lose this two-day head start that your infection gets. That's, that's, you know, we've eradicated smallpox on the basis of this trick, right? Of uh, exposing you to an attenuated or killed version of the pathogen. Okay. All right. But uh, this thing is called uh, clonal selection theory. So it's got a fabulous history, which I'll bore you to death about if you ask me to. Okay. So that's, that's how adaptive immunity works. What's it got to do with cancer? And why is cancer immunotherapy one of the, uh, basically, the hottest thing in, in, in medical circles at the moment? The reason is that system, as I've described it, and like the minute we're finished with this talk, you're going to realize that there are all sorts of holes that I didn't tell you about. But, uh, so I'm being very sketchy. But basically, the beauty of that system is that every other drug you get in your life are all very nonspecific, right? They go in, so for example, cancer. Uh, what's a hallmark of cancer? Cancer is cells of your own body that have accumulated mutations that have led them to divide and divide and divide and not die. Right? So every cell in your body is designed to kill itself after a period of time. Cancer is something where, some, uh, and it's, it's very large deviations ish actually, you normally accumulate a large number of errors in different parts of the cell function, and eventually what happens is it starts producing lots of offspring, none of which die, and you get a growth. Okay? Um, most chemotherapies, what they do is they kill fast dividing cells. That's kind of your classifier. Your classifier is fast dividing cells are probably cancerous, which is why your hair falls out, because that's, well, not, not per chance, that fell out for a different reason. The, the, <laughs> they fall out because they're fast dividing cells, and so they get caught up as collateral damage, right? The beauty of your immune system is it's highly specific. The adaptive immune response is entirely specific. It targets just these um, apparently foreign aspects to your body. Um, but the thing with cancer, of course, is that cancer started out as being part of you. And your immune system is tolerized that it doesn't attempt to kill things that look like they come from you. So initially, uh, the cancerous cells that you have in your body look very like your own cells. And so um, you're unlikely to launch an immune response against them. What happens here, what I'm showing you, is this is a, a, a very uh, significant piece of work where people took different forms of human cancers. And what they're characterizing is how distinct those cancers look from the human that they were taken from. How many mutations have they acquired? And in particular, as your cancer grows, it has a tendency to acquire new mutations that make it look less and less like you. And then eventually, as you can imagine, your immune system can recognize it as being foreign. Okay? Uh, and what happens is that for something like melanoma, where uh, it's a skin cancer, 
the cancer was probably triggered by a nasty blast of light very early on, so clonally the whole thing can very quickly look quite foreign for you. What you find is if you have a melanoma and you look in it, that you discover there's parts of your immune system are in there looking at that melanoma, thinking something is not quite right, but typically not clearing it. Okay? And so what cancer immunotherapy is trying to do is take an either incipient or non-existing immune response and trigger it to the cancer. All right? um, and there's, um, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to go back to the immunology just for a second. Uh, in part because I thought Muriel would enjoy um, me sticking trusted source somehow into this. Um, it's, it's quite interesting. So, um, as I said, your immune system just on seeing something foreign, it doesn't kick off. And, and in fact, uh, there's a, a Phil, my collaborator, wrote a very beautiful review about 15 years ago of the development of the theories as people understood um, the the need for cooperation in your immune system before it would launch a response. And it resulted in something called two-signal theory. And in two-signal theory, what happens is, as well as you using this very specific respector to see something foreign, that cell also has to get a second signal before it will kick off. And the question is, what is the nature of that second signal? And it has a curious history, uh, which very few other fields can have uh, the the, the oddity of, of including where uh, one of the significant contributors was an ex-Playboy bunny. Mm -hmm. And that's not a joke, Polly Matzinger, she's incredible. Um, but basically, it was quite curious. Very quickly, people found a second signal. So what happens is, if part of your innate immune system, something very non-specific, can secrete effectively inflammatory signals, right? So these are small molecules, which is basically your innate immune system has said, I've seen something foreign here and it's releasing that information. If I'm, now, um, if I'm now part of your adaptive immune response, I see something foreign, and I see it in the presence of this inflammation signal, I, I decide to kick off. But quite curiously, people very quickly discovered there was a lot of redundancy in that sec second signal. There could be loads of different inflammatory cytokines. People were quite confused by it. Why is there a lot of redundancy rather than one special second signal? And on top of that, um, Effectively, so I'm only going to talk about T cells, but they're just one of the two types of lymphocyte. T cells are responsible for finding aberrant cells in your body. You can think of it that way. So if a virus gets into your body, it gets into a cell, hijacks the machinery. So how do you, from the outside of a, of a cell, decide that it's aberrant and do something about it? Every cell in your body, everything that it makes, it chops up into small bits and sticks out on the cell surface. Okay? And there's basically you have a lifting mechanism where you stick it out on the cell surface. T cells wander around your body, probing the surface of the cells in your body. If a cell is not sticking stuff out on its cell surface, it has something to hide and you kill it. Okay? Uh, alternatively, it's sticking stuff out on its cell surface that you recognize as foreign, uh, then, then also then you will launch an immune response. But that's kind of if it comes across an infected cell. There's a second way in which it can do so. A lot of your uh, lymphocytes live in your lymph nodes uh, and a couple of other organs. And what happens is you have these cells that wander around your body, typically dendritic cells, have big long arms, picking up detritus they find in your body, bring it back to your lymph nodes, go around to all the T cells and go, any of this look foreign to you? Okay. If the cell sees, if my T cell sees this antigen in that context, it gets a second signal. And the second signal, it's called a co-stimulatory signal, is saying, not only am I showing you something foreign, but I'm one of the surveillance team, basically. Um, and that can also motivate them to divide. So there's loads of redundant mechanisms that can motivate them to divide. So how this is being harnessed for cancer is one of two ways. One of them is called adaptive T cell transfer therapy. So the idea is you have cancer. Sorry, I don't want to wish that on anybody. Uh, someone has cancer. You go and look in them. And what you do is uh, you pull out cells from their immune system that seem to be hanging around the cancer. Right? So they seem to be recognizing something is there, but I probably shouldn't attack it. You take it out, and then you throw a load of cytokines at it. So you get it riled up. 
So these are the small inflammatory signals that they would get from our innate immune system. You kind of take them out and you and you and you kind of whisper in their ear, right? You know, and uh, you you massively expand them in the Petri dish. So I take cells from you and, and I give them all of these secondary signals to say, you're really under attack. You build a huge big army, we inject them into the patient, they go and hunt. They're now all riled up and they go and hunt and clear it. Uh, if my pal, Tan Schumacher from the Netherlands Cancer Institute was here, he would now show you a slide where he had patients that had these grotesque, massive melanomas. Um, and they had like three to six months to live, which is why he got his hands on them. It's now five to 10 years later, and they just have scar tissue where they used to have melanomas. So that's one thing. It's, it's very expensive, quite complicated. Um, and the second one, which is actually the more topical thing, I think is totally weird. Um, and I'm only going to describe it briefly. Um, you'll hear a little bit of, about it, though, like if you, even in the, in the pop science press or newspapers these days. Um, and these things are, one of them at least is being approved, and there's a whole load of other ones who are in, in stage two trials. One of the other things that happens in your body, as well as providing positive signals, you can actually provide negative signals to your immune system. And in fact, people who have things like MS, uh, what happens is that the, the treatments interferon, beta interferon, gamma, you're giving a damping signal to the immune response. You're trying to tell it to calm down. On cells themselves, what happens is they express other receptors on the cell surface as well as presenting stuff that they see. They go, oh, I'm one of you, right? And so PD-1 is one of those things. It's a thing that all of the cells in your body will express on its cell surface so that when you're T cells are wandering around and they see it. As they might see something and see it's foreign, but on the other hand, the, the cell also says, but I'm one of you. And so what the treatment is doing is basically you're trying to block that second signal. Right? So you give a, a monoclonal antibody that floats around in your body, glues onto the surface of these things. So now when your T cell goes up to it, it sees that, but it doesn't get the second bind and the negative signal. The reason why this is pretty weird is I said the whole joy of your immune system is it's super specific. Whereas if I give you this treatment, then what happens is I kind of disguise nearly every cell in your body, doesn't get to provide the second signal that it says it's one of you, and you stand a reasonable chance of launching an immune response against yourself. And in fact, um, with this treatment, even though this is gonna, you're, this will get FDA approval, there's already one, and it's all the rage. Um, in 10 to 20 percent of people who get this treatment, you get a severe autoimmune reaction up to and including death, which is pretty severe. Did you get the idea? Not really. <gasps> okay. Can I just see the idea? How does it save you? I mean, so the, the cancer cell is saying, I'm one of you. And so what you do is you, yeah. you, you, you go yeah. and you block it from yeah. saying that. So now what happens is it's expressing foreign stuff on the cell surface and it's and it, normally it will be seeing that but it would also be but i'm one of you don't don't hurt me and and so you block the you you block the i'm one of you signal yeah okay there's actually two of them ctla4 I, i'm not giving you the names of these things I'm, I'm really not a fan of acronyms but in biology it's worse because what happens is most of these things got their name from the first instance where they were discovered and then later on we find that isn't their function at all, but they retain the name. So PD stands for program cell death, and it has nothing to do with program cell death. Um, okay, but this is really, uh, like within our lifetimes, should we get unlucky and end up with nasty cancers, these will end up being treatments that we get if your care is good. Um, and so, so how am I gonna go from that to my tree puzzle? Mm -hmm. So we'll see if I manage. Um, Phil's review is, is quite interesting because I said that, that this two signal theory, there were a lot of conundra fairly early on anyway, and that there was some redundancy in what this second signal should be. I should see something foreign and I should get this second signal. Uh, and at the end of the paper, he commented that the, he, didn't, he didn't really believe it. He proposed that more rigorous quantitative methods were required to sustain theoretical development into the future. Uh, and the reason for that was that um, he had a suspicion. And the suspicion was that, as I said, when you, when you give these cells these signals, if they really get going, they exponentially expand. And what he found was that if you give them some of the signals, they expand a bit. 
give them some more, they can expand further. And what he thought was happening was people were kind of binarizing into whether something was a response or not, rather than quantitatively carefully looking at it. So it took us a long time to get around to doing anything about it. Um, and looking at this thing of trying to quantitatively determine, we have multiple signals we can give these cells, and trying to figure out an algebra of how they, how they interpret them. Uh, it, it took three developments. The first was a brilliant student, uh, uh, Julia Marchingo, who's now in Dundee. Uh, I'll, I can tell you the other two in a second, but basically what we're trying to do is trying to quantitatively look at, okay, so one of these cells, I always have to give it that original stimulation. I always have to show it something foreign, which is this T cell receptor signal. I can then give it either signals it would receive from a trusted source. Right? There are two different signals it could receive from a trusted source, which could give it some expansion. Or I could give it this rake of small secreted inflammatory molecules. And the question is, how do they act in combination? You know, is it, uh, is it the maximum of the signals that they receive? How, how does it work? Okay. And so in order to study this quantitatively carefully, we needed three different things. Um, the first thing we needed, I told you, if I take two cells from your body, <laughs> Uh, with high likelihood the receptors are going to be very different. Um, nobody paused and, and uh, wondered how I, you could have 10 to the 12 objects in your body that codify these different receptors, right? This is a huge number. And actually how they're codified is very beautiful. Everybody's DNA in this room contains a, a stochastic program, a card shuffling algorithm uh, that is used to generate that receptor diversity, right? Um, and it has a fabulous history uh, because it was, uh, which I won't tell the full story because uh, we don't have time, but it's worth reading about where the fact that your DNA codes for a random algorithm uh, was speculated in 1957, not long after the structure of DNA was discovered and it was almost heretical at the time. Um, a Nobel Prize was given in the 1980s uh, to Tanagawa for our, um, for actually figuring out the structure of that randomized algorithm. So how you get this diversity of receptors is by a randomized algorithm in your DNA. So our first trick is we have a mouse uh, called an OT1 mouse where we've frozen that, the random number generator <laughs> and every T cell in that mouse has the same receptor. Right? So we're freezing that. And as a result, we've characterized that receptor. That receptor is well characterized and we know the foreign things that will bind to it. Okay? So that's number one. Number two um, is a device to allow us to measure expansion, right? Because I'm going to take cells and I'm going to stimulate them and I'm going to want to know how much they divide. And the device that we're going to use is, um, is a dye, a division diluting dye that was found by happenstance by two Australian scientists in the early 1990s. Uh, and the way it works it is really kind of neat. Um, the original dye, which has a real ugly long name, CFSE, um, is the shorthand for it, uh, is, is a green fluorescent dye. And if I take cells and I incubate them with that green fluorescent dye, they imbibe the dye, but it doesn't affect their function. It just, they're just happy with it. Um, and what happens is if I take a bunch of cells, uh, these T cells say, and, and I give them this dye and they imbibe it, and I shine a laser light through them, uh, what you're seeing here is this is the level of dye, and the, the vertical line is telling you how many objects uh, had that intensity. Right? Then what happens is, you know, early on, they all have the same level of intensity, but as they divide, their daughters get uh, inherit about half of the dye. And so when I shine a laser light through them, they will fluoresce with half the intensity, and their daughters will fluoresce with half the intensity. So this is a fairly typical sort of time course of how this data looks. We take a load of cells, we give them this dye, they're initially all in generation zero, if you like, and then after a couple of days, some of them have divided once, some of them have divided twice, and so on, right? So you get the, get the idea, approximately? All right, so we're gonna use this to try and figure out how much division is occurring. All right, and so this will be sort of, I, I won't dwell on it overly, but this is background material uh, to what I wanna get to, which is the trees because um, I know you, you'll be all upset if there's no math. Okay, so um, what happened was that we, 
anyway, something that's fairly untopical these days. We use really quite reduced systems uh, to do to, to look at these things. But but basically here what I'm showing you is um, this is the average amount of division that we're getting from a population of cells. So we're going to take like a thousand or two thousand cells. We're going to give them this dye so that we can figure out uh, how much division is occurring. Um, and then what we're going to do is expose them with combinations of signals. We always have to give them the antigen, otherwise they don't get going. Um, so on the bottom curve from each of these, these are going to be different signals. These, these two signals are signals they would receive from a trusted source. These three signals are, are signals they were received through circ secreted cytokines, these small molecules from inflammation. Um, and the bottom curve from all of them will be like the control. That's just, I just give you uh, the antigen alone. I only give you the foreign pathogen. I don't give you the extra signal. So that should, in principle, be the same for all of them. Um, and what happens is it turns out it's quite, quite interesting. It's already quite instructive that <laughs> the difference between these four lines is in the bottom one, there's no second signal. And you, you get about one division on average. So they all divide a little bit. They just don't really get going. Um, the reason why there are three other lines is we either put that second signal in from the start and then take it away after 26 hours, or we don't put it in at the start and then we add it after 26 hours, or we leave it in the whole time. 26 hours is around the time that they divide for the first time. And what happens is that the signal that they would receive from the trusted source only influences them if the original cell saw that signal. So that, that very first one before it even divided once, if it saw the second signal, then it gets additional expansion. If we leave it in, it doesn't, it doesn't make it expand any further. The fact that the offspring still see the signal doesn't make a difference. Uh, and moreover, if we add it after the first division has occurred, they don't see it at all. Right? So this, this signal you see from the trusted source, you don't repeatedly learn from it. Somehow it's instructed into that original cell. Whereas with all of the secreted information that they're receiving, uh, that behaves in a very smooth, dose-dependent way. The longer you're exposed to, no, no matter which cell in the response is exposed to, you will get additional expansion. Okay? And the reason why some of this would make sense is, again, um, more likely than not, um, this original cell will be in a lymph node it will see this foreign thing as presented to it by a, by a professional cell that will say also, I picked this up somewhere. Uh, it causes a little burst of expansion. They then potter off around your body looking for the infection. If they come across somewhere where there's an, there's an, an awful lot of local information that there's inflammation going on here, uh, then they will expand further. Okay. Um, I'll try and cut through this quite quickly, but what these crash plots are showing is basically these, these curves that look like hysteresis. What you're showing is this is the average amount of division and sort of time is running this way. So this is a population and this is a time course. Um, this black line on the base is just a control where we only give the antigen. We only give the, the thing that binds to the T cell receptor, no, no, no second signal. Um, and here what's happening, for example, is we're seeing how much additional division do we get from giving um, one of these two signals that they will get from a professional antigen presenting cell. Um, skipping from here to here, so if the amount of expansion you were getting was some simply linear and additive, then what would happen would be um, the gap between this expansion from just the antigen and the second signal, this is what I'm getting from, from the contribution from it, whereas the gap between here and the dark blue line is what I'm getting from that. And what happens is if we throw them in together, then we find it, we just get a linear algebra. Right? So the, each individual signal, and, and we got this kind of universally uh, across a whole swathe of signals, each individual signal is causing an extra number of rounds of division. And if I give you two signals, and one is giving you one round of division, and the other one's giving you an additional two, then you'll get three. Like, and it's a very, very simple, uh, it's, and it's not what any of us would have predicted, that they're just doing this very, very simple um, uh, linear interpretation of the signals. The reason why it would have been missed previously is 
these are numbers of rounds of division and therefore one extra round of division doubles my population and so if you're binarizing based on a threshold of numbers you either see your response or you don't but but it, in reality what happens is you have these very very linear sorts of behaviors okay and i'm going to skip the next bit but these are all in very controlled cultures but we uh, designed experiments where we could show this also is happening inside mice um, so we have strong evidence that this is really how it's working even in the more complex system, which I'll skip over. So how am I going to get uh, to trees? Uh, well, let me tell you one other thing. Here I'm saying mean amounts of expansion. Okay? One of the things that we noticed, uh, of course these are, these are heterogeneous, we noticed that the variance in the amount of expansion that was happening uh, looked like it was, it was also adding. Okay, so <laughs> I have this heterogeneous signal that gives me an, a certain amount of expansion um, and when I give you a pair of them they add up and the variances also look like they're adding up, right? Um, and so that was suggestive that, you know, the individual families, the individual cells are seeing these heterogeneous things and perhaps seeing them independently, right? And so we set about trying to design a system to look at that. Okay. As I said, there's an awful lot of these cancer immunotherapies. They depend on which of these signals you give and in what combination. And there's a load of kind of hodgepodge just searching to try and find combinations. And so what we're trying to do is make this really very quantitative. Um, okay. So that previous experimental system I described, what it allows me to do is like take everybody in this room stain them with a dye, have you go off and procreate, and then come back and figure out how many children there are. But I can't associate them to an individual, right? That they just, it's, it's a bulk population level measurement. It gives me the average amount of expansion that's occurred um, as a group. And what we'd really be interested in doing is understanding something about the individual families. And so if I give you, say, a population, and this is just fake data, showing you, like, for example, uh, so division destiny is what we call the, the final depth of these, uh, uh, the, the generation in which these cells stop dividing. If I give you a population and I see that some cells stop dividing after one division or two or three or four or five, it could be that at a family level, uh, each row here corresponds to a family, and it could be that each individual family was kind of highly co concordant, much like that earlier picture, you know, you get one expansion or the whole thing divides twice or it divides more. Or it could be that I get very frayed families. I'd get family trees where, where some of the offspring would divide once or twice or three times. And in fact, every mathematical model used to analyze dividing cells effectively will give you pictures like here on the right, because they're all Bellman-Harris processes. So, you know, we always model these things as being like independent lifetimes and so on. Um, we had cause to, sus to, to suspect that maybe it was something like this concordance. Okay. And the reason why it would be important was that if the behavior of these cells were producing these very concordant trees, so very regular trees, it would also mean that they must be sharing some piece of information, right? So there's not re-randomization going on. Somehow offspring that are cousins or second cousins in a tree or sharing information. Okay. So back to, back to my puzzle. So did people solve my puzzle? You know, I'm in, I'm, I, you know, I'm in a room full of my heroes here, you know, Sean and Peter and Shrikant and, and you know. Uh, Prashant is only my age, so he, he gets away with, he gets away with <laughs> not necessarily having to solve it in the 20 minutes. Um, what happens is actually quite curious. So um, if I describe uh, each one of these trees by a vector, which tells me um, the number of leaves, uh, terminal leaves in each generation, then, then what happens is the tree that you get by concatenation is just the, the convolution of those vectors. Um, and, and that's why it's working here on the right, because it's just the convolution. Um, and moreover, it's incredibly robust. Uh, I described it earlier on as if you're doing it just by concatenation, but actually you can do things like, um, I can take one of these trees and do a cut through the tree, take the other tree and insert it everywhere along the cut, and re-glue the missing bits, and it will still work. It's incredibly robust. 
And that's very nice for us for reasons I'll kind of explain. So, because what we're going to be interested in is we're going to give families exposure to two signals. And what I want to know is okay, one signal gives you some level of expansion, another signal.
so we also want to that. So what we're going to do, of course, is we're going to stimulate in the four different combinations. We're going to stimulate them just for the atoms. Then we're going to stimulate just for one signal, just for a different signal, not for both. Because what we want to test is whether the sum of two atoms